Hi and welcome to Neurovascular Anatomy. This is part one of the lecture series on Neurovascular Anatomy. So in today's class we'll be covering the topic under the following headings: Neuroembryology of cranial vasculature, external carotid artery, and internal carotid artery. In the other parts we will cover the other different arteries supplying the brain and spine. So coming to the first section for today, that is the neuroembryology of cranial vasculature. So from an evolutionary perspective, there are two basic tenets that are followed whenever the vasculature of the entire body is decided. The basic blueprint is that there are transversely oriented vessels and these are connected by longitudinal ones. So there are a bunch of transversely oriented vessels like these and then they get connected by longitudinal ones which form channels and that those form the main arteries. So these longitudinal anastomosis will form rostrocaudal channels and these transverse vessels will end up regressing. The second tenet is as more and more cerebral territories emerge, instead of forming newer arteries, there's going to be a recruitment of the existing vascular networks only. So when we look at what happens with evolution, the fish has a simpler system. Here the entire brain is supplied only by the carotid circulation, there's no supply from the posterior or the vertebral artery circulation. They basically have a cranial ramus and a caudal ramus of the ICA. The cranial ramus gives rise to two arteries, the medial and the lateral olfactory artery. The medial olfactory artery is basically like a primitive ACA and the la lateral olfactory artery is basically like a primitive recurrent artery of Hubner and anterior caudal artery. The caudal ramus which gives rise to structures which resemble PCOM and top of the basilar artery. There's also a separate vessel arising from the caudal ramus that is the TA or the tectal artery and the cerebral artery. So these supply the posterior uh, uh, areas like the brainstem and the cerebellum. With amphibians, it slightly evolves further. They have a larger basal ganglia and cerebellum. So this, these arteries then further hypertrophy. As we discussed, they don't form new channels. There's further recruitment of the existing channels. So the lateral olfactory artery will hypertrophy and form two branches, a lateral striate artery, which is like a primitive MCA, and a posterior telencephalic artery, which is supply the posterior telencephalon, which is the area of the PCA, but this is a primitive anterior choroidal artery. The tectal artery and the cerebellar artery ends up also having another branch forming the posterior choroidal artery. As we go on to reptiles, there's still no supply from the vertebral artery and the entire brain is supplied only by the ICA itself. So here you have further uh, resemblance towards the human vascular system. So the medial olfactory artery is fused together and form an ACOM-like structure. The lateral striate artery further hypertrophies and forms a structure known as the lateral striate perforators, which is basically a primitive MCA and the posterior telencephalic artery supplying the predominant area of the posterior cerebral hemisphere. With birds, you have further progression, but still no supply coming from the vertebral artery. Here you have a discrete MCA which arises, and most of this posterior hemisphere gets supplied by the tectal artery, rather than the posterior telencephalic artery, as it was being supplied so far. So this tectal artery is basically like a PCA territory now. In mammals, even the uh, lesser evolved mammals like sheep and dogs, the brain is supplied only by the carotids. When it comes to monkeys, apes and humans, finally the vertebral artery starts annexing part of the brain. So it annexes the circulation to the brainstem and the cerebellum in other mammals, but only in humans is it able to annex the circulation of the PCA territory as well. In 25% of these uh, individuals, the vertebral basilar territory does not annex the PCA territory and they continue to have a fetal PCA. As the vertebral artery annexes this flow, uh, the flow changes from caudal to rostral. Okay, so how, how do these vessels arise in an embryo and what is the embryogenesis for cranial vasculature? So at day 18 of embryogenesis, the vasculogenesis begins. Here, the underlying endoderm will induce the overlying splanchnic mesoderm and they will form angioblastic cells. So these angioblasts will join together and they'll form two tubes known as the dorsal aorta. Then the dorsal aorta will also get linked up with the primitive heart and join together 
and the, there'll be an aortic sac over here and then the embryo will fold over and these dorsal aorta will end up forming arches so this folding will create these aortic arches so the, as we know there are six arches the fifth one disappears and doesn't really give rise to anything and there are different segments of these arches which will disappear and give rise to this ultimate final structure so from the first arch we have maxillary arteries arising from the second arch you have hyoid and stapedial arteries arising from the third arch is where you get the common carotid artery and the first part of the ICA. From the fourth arch on the left side, you get part of the aorta, which is from the left CCA up to the left subclavian artery. The fourth arch on the right side gives rise to the right subclavian artery. The sixth arch on the left side gives rise to the left pulmonary artery and the ductus arteriosus. And the sixth arch on the right side gives rise to the right pulmonary artery. Okay, so that is how the ICA and the ECA arise, but how do the how does the cranial vasculature arise? So basically in front of the rhombencephalon or the brain stem, there are these longitudinal plexiform vessels which form. And that is known as a longitudinal neural artery. And it's a plexiform anastomotic connection basically. And this is the predecessor for the basilar artery. A branch will arise from this dorsal aorta and it will supply this plexiform structure. So that first branch which supplies the structure is known as a trigeminal artery. This uh, trigeminal artery uh, first of all gets initial supply from the dorsal aorta and as the dorsal aorta forms a distal ICA the trigeminal artery becomes a branch of the ICA instead of a branch of the dorsal aorta. Multiple such anastomoses then exist between the ICA and this longitudinal neural artery and uh, they these are like the trigeminal artery. You can also get the otic artery, the hypoglossal artery, and the first cervical intersegmental artery, which will connect the ICA and the primitive basilar artery. So as we can see, the basilar artery initially is getting all its supply from the ICA itself. Okay. Then this ICA primitive structure, it will end up forming a cranial and a caudal ramus. So the Caudal branch will give rise to the posterior communicating artery, the P1, PCA, and part of this basilar artery. As this PCOM takes over, these other anastomoses will disappear. Okay, and then the PCOM only will stick. The cranial branch, on the other hand, forms the ACA, MC, anterior and anterior communicating arteries. In the fifth week, the anterior and posterior caudal arteries develop, and the pica starts to arise from the basilar or longitudinal neural arteries. In the 6th and 7th weeks, the longitudinal neural artery will finally coalesce and they will form the midline basilar. And as we saw, there are multiple cervical intersegmental arteries over here, as we can see. So they will form a longitudinal anastomosis and then the intersegmental arteries will disappear. So this anastomosis is what forms the vertebral artery. Okay, then the vertebral artery will finally join with the lower end of the basilar artery and then it will take over the supply of the rhombencephalon. Okay, so as we saw, the initial supply of this basilar artery or the longitudinal plexus in front of the rhombencephalon is initially only from the ICA. As the PCOM takes over, these different anastomotic connections will disappear. There is a chance at times when this anastomotic connections do not disappear and they persist. So that is known as a persistent carotid vertebrobasilar anastomosis. So normal PCOM is the most per common persistent anastomosis and the dominant PCOM or fetal PCA is present in about 25% of patients or uh, in 25% of individuals, I'm sorry. So these, uh, <clears throat> this, in the fetal PCA, the entire posterior circulation, or sorry, the PCA itself is supplied by the ICA. In uh, other individuals where there might be other persistent anastomoses which are not related to PCOM, these are present only in about 0.1 to 1.2% of individuals and 85% of this would be the persistent trigeminal artery. The persistent trigeminal artery actually arises from the most, uh, from the proximal cavernous ICA and it courses basically along the trigeminal nerve. So it initially courses medial to the ophthalmic nerve in the cavernous ICA, then it runs medial to the trigeminal nerve and, and then it passes to the mid basilar artery. Sometimes it can even pass through the dorsum cella to reach the basilar artery. If it is present, it means that other 
avenues for blood to come to the posterior circulation are should not be present so your pcom and your vertebral artery should be hypoplastic in this case there could also be other anastomoses like the persistent hypoglossal the persistent proatlantal intersegmental and the persistent otic so the persistent hypoglossal arises actually from the distal cervical ica then it enters through the hypoglossal canal and joins with the proximal basilar artery it arises somewhere between c1 and c3 level the persistent proatlantal intersegmental artery on the other hand it connects a distal cervical ica to the vertebral artery all of it is going to be extra dural and extra cranial so it runs between the occiput and the c1 arch all of it is extra cranial and connects a distal cervical ica to the vertebral artery there's also a another anastomosis which exists which is the rarest type that is a persistent otic artery it arises from the petrous part of the ica and it runs to the proximal basilar artery through the internal acoustic canal okay so that is about embryology let's discuss about the external carotid artery the external carotid artery it uh, is found in the well named carotid triangle so this triangle is bounded by the sternocleidomastoid posteriorly the omohyoid inferiorly and the posterior belly of the digastric and the stylohyoid superiorly so in this triangle is where you will find the common carotid bifurcation the eca and the ica so the most important thing to know about the eca what are the different branches which arise from the eca so they are quite easy to remember there are a lot of anterior branches uh, the first anterior branch is a superior thyroid artery so this is the first branch of the eca and it arises at the level of the hyoid bone the second branch is the lingual artery so this arises just above the point at which the superior thyroid artery arises the third anterior branch is the facial artery so this arises a few millimeters above the lingual artery it courses deeper to the digastric and stylohyoid runs in a groove here at the level of the mandible and most importantly it terminates medial to the eye as the angular artery the angular artery is important because here you can have anastomoses with branches of the ica through the ophthalmic artery so this is an area where dangerous anastomoses between the eca and the ica can happen so there are a lot of other areas where there can be important eca ica anastomoses so one as we saw is between the angular artery of the facial artery and branches of the ophthalmic like the supratrochlear and the supraorbital artery the supratrochlear and supraorbital artery may also anastomose with branches of the superior temporal artery you also have very common anastomoses at the level of the pia and the dura with the middle meningeal artery and branches of the ica you can also have anastomoses between the basilar uh, between the posterior circulation that's the vertebral and the basilar and the pca vessels and the occipital artery so all these anastomoses can be important especially when you're trying to embolize some of these vessels and you might end up embolizing intracranial vessels also important as sources of transfers of thrombi and infections <coughs> so that is about the anterior branches of the internal carotid artery the posterior branches are two in number there's the occipital artery which arises from the posterior wall of the eca and it crosses the ica and runs between the c1 transverse process and the tip of the mastoid okay so there are multiple important branches which can arise from the occipital artery uh, a very important branch is one which is supplying the posterior fossa dura which enters through the jugular fossa apart from that you also get muscular branches which supply the sternocleidomastoid and the muscular branches of the suboccipital muscles so these can also form dangerous anastomoses with the vertebral artery you can also have a posterior auricular you also have the posterior auricular artery arising from the posterior wall of the ica <coughs> from the posterior wall of the eca i'm sorry and uh, it actually can even arise from the uh, from the um, occipital artery so usually it terminates at the space between the eac and the mastoid process uh the other important branch of the uh, eca is the ascending pharyngeal artery so this arises from the eca near the cca bifurcation it also may arise from the ica sometimes even from the base of the occipital artery or even more distally on the occipital artery again this gives rise to a branch which can supply the posterior fossa dura 
that is the posterior meningeal branch this can enter either through the jugular foramen or it may enter through the hypoglossal canal so it can also form dangerous anastomosis with the vertebral artery so this can be important to remember when we're trying to embolize these vessels there are two terminal branches of the ECA which is a superficial temporal artery and the internal maxillary artery so superficial temporal artery is one of the most important branches of the ECA when it comes to neurosurgery because it's very important for conditions for bypass so this originates in the parotid gland at the base back of the base of the mandible and a very important way to identify the superficial temporal artery is that it will form a loop okay or it will arch over the zygomatic arch so you can use that curve to identify the superficial temporal artery after it goes over the zygomatic arch it will go up it will be highly tortuous and it will form an anterior and a posterior division the internal maxillary artery on the other hand is a main continuation of the ECA it will pass behind the ramus of the mandible and it will course superficial or deep lateral pterygoid and give rise to multiple different branches an important one to remember obviously is the middle meningeal artery okay so that brings us to our last section for this class that is the internal carotid artery so with the internal carotid artery we'll discuss a few segments and then we'll keep a few segments for the next session <clears throat> so when it comes to discussing the internal carotid artery it is important to divide the different areas of the internal carotid artery so we know which part of ICA we're discussing the first classification system which came up for the ICA was the Fisher classification system which had a significant limitation that was numbered against the direction of flow so as you can see C1 started from the top the communicating segment and C5 was the Peter segment so this doesn't really make any sense and that is why we do not use the Fisher classification then second classification system which came up is a roton classification which is quite simple there's only a, there's only four segments the cervical the petrus the cavernous and the supraclinoid but this disregards many different areas of the uh, ICA which has which have significance so this is also not a very commonly used classification system then came a classification system by Las Johnius which divided the ICA into seven different segments but most of these segments were not very useful for surgical interventions so the seven segments were cervical ascending and horizontal intrapetrus ascending foramen lacerum a horizontal intercavernous clenodal and terminal which is similar to the butelia classification but is, but not very useful for surgical interventions the most commonly used classification system is the Botelia classification system which has seven segments so this includes the cervical segment the petrus segment the segment overlying the foramen lacerum that's the lateral segment the cavernous segment the segment medial to the clinoid process so that is the clinoidal segment the segment between the ophthalmic and the communicating that's the ophthalmic segment and the segment after the communicating artery so that is the communicating segment Okay, so this is the most commonly used system now, but there are limitations for endovascular and endoscopic uses. So there's an endovascular classification system by, uh, proposed by Shapiro, which has seven segments, which are also quite similar, but they are more or less defined by arteries which can be visualized on DSA. So you have the cervical segment, you have the petrus segment and the cavernous segment, that's as usual. But because we're able to see the ophthalmic artery, there's a paraophthalmic segment, there's a posterior communicating segment, an anterior choroidal segment, and a terminal segment. Labib also proposed an endoscopic classification system with six different segments. So this is useful, obviously, for endoscopic anatomy. So these are defined by the area of the ICA and the area of the surrounding anatomy. So in the pharynx, the part of the ICA there would be the parapharyngeal ICA. So similarly, the part in the petrous bone would be the petrous ICA. The part next to the clivus would be the paraclival ICA. The part next to the cella would be the paracellar ICA. The part next to the clenoid would be the paraclenoid ICA. And the part inside the dura would be the intradural ICA. So this is useful endoscopically only and does not really have any utility in transcranial regions. Right, so that is uh, about the classification systems for the ICA. Now coming to the anatomy of the internal carotid artery, the ICA arises from the CCA bifurcation and CCA bifurcation can be identified by the Farabee strangle. 
which lies between the internal jugular vein here, the hypoglossal nerve here, and another venous structure known as a thyrolingofacial trunk, which joins up and ultimately joins into the internal jugular vein. So this should be able to identify the location of the CCA bifurcation, usually. Majority of the time, more than 90% of the time, the CCA bifurcation will lie between the level of the hyoid bone and the superior border of thyroid cartilage. In almost 50%, it is at the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. About 25% will be opposite the hyoid bone. And in about 20%, it is between thyroid cartilage and hyoid bone. Very rarely will it be, will it be above the superior border of the thyroid cartilage or sorry, below, lower than the superior border of the thyroid cartilage or higher than the hyoid bone. So in more than 90% should be between the hyoid bone and the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. The C1 of the cervical portion has absolutely no branches. It initially lies superficial or more lateral to the ECA, but after some time it turns medially and it passes deeper to the ECA. The posterior belly of the digastric will divide into two different portions, that is the suprahyoid part above the hyoid bone and then the part below, behind the styloid process, that is the post styloid part. The suprahyoid part is as located over here. So it, there are multiple different relations of, of the suprahyoid part. The longest capitis muscle lies posteriorly, the pharynx lies medially, the internal jugular vein lies posterior laterally. Then you have the hypoglossal nerve, which lies laterally, and the ansa cervicalis, which will be running on this carotid sheath. The vagus nerve running between the IC and the IG, IJV within the carotid sheath, and the sympathetic chain lying posteriorly. When this ICA crosses the stylopharyngeus, you get the post-styloid part. So it passes behind the digastric and the styloid muscles to enter the post-styloid space. Here it is bounded posteriorly by the prevertebral plane and medially you have the pharynx. Here the glossopharyngeal nerve will cross between the ICA and the IGV and supply the stylopharynges. <coughs> Excuse me. At the skull base, the ICA and the IGV will finally separate from each other. The ICA will enter the carotid canal and the IGV will be leaving out from the jugular foramen. So here, these two structures, because they diverge, they form an angle known as a carotico-jugular angle. In this angle, there are two important nerves which lie. There's a tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is known as the Jacobson's nerve. And there's a auricular branch of the vagus nerve known as the Arnold's nerve. So these enter through these two tiny foramina in this space. The C2 of the Peter's portion is the part which is lying within the Peter's bone. So this starts at the point where the artery will enter the carotid canal and it will end when it passes below the petrolingual ligament to enter the cavernous sinus. So it has three segments of the vertical segment posteriorly. There's a horizontal segment and then there's an ascending uh, segment again, the anterior vertical segment. So it also has two bends, there's a posterior genome and there's an anterior genome. So it's a little, little bit similar to the cavernous segment. So there's a posterior vertical part, middle horizontal part, and anterior vertical part with two genomes. So the posterior vertical segment actually will lie behind the eustachian tube but in front of the inner ear. It will lie ahead of the cochlea and will be separated from the tympanic cavity by only a thin bone. The, an important branch which arises from the segment is the carotico-tympanic branch. It will enter the tympanic cavity through a small foramen and then it will anastomose with multiple other arteries. The C2 or Peter segment also has a horizontal segment most often which is unroofed okay and so this unroofed part of the petrous segment usually lies lateral okay or completely outside the Meckel's cave in almost 72 percent sometimes in 17 percent it can lie just under the middle portion of the Meckel's cave and very rarely is it completely covered by the petrolingual ligament this horizontal segment will run behind the eustachian tube and the tensor tympanic muscle so this horizontal segment also is surrounded by venous plexus and an autonomic plexus. This autonomic plexus will arise in the superior cervical ganglion and then it will end up forming the deep petrosal nerve. As we know, the deep petrosal nerve will join with the GSPN arising from the facial uh, ganglion right there 
they will join together they will form the vidian nerve which will follow the ICA the ice and then there it will enter the vidian canal and finally and go go into the pterygopalatine ganglia the c2 uh, portion does usually give branches so this could be the pterygoid artery which may not always be present and and this can supply the pterygoid canal <coughs> okay the vidian artery which can supply the vidian canal there can be an embryonic vessel arising from the c2 petrous portion that is a stapedial artery and it actually traverses the primordium of the crust of the stapes so this disappears in adulthood um, sorry, this disappears after the fetal stage and there can be an artery supplying the periosteum known as the periosteal artery <coughs> The third segment of the ICA is the cavernous or the C3 portion. This starts at the point where the artery passes under the petal ligament ligament, okay, and then it enters the cavernous sinus, and then at the point of the distal dural ring is where the cavernous portion ends. So just like the petal segment is the posterior ascending part, there's a posterior genu, there's a horizontal part, there's an anterior genu, and there's an anterior vertical part. The part in the cavernous sinus and the supraclinal part, they both curve and look like an S. So that is what is known as the cavernous, as the carotid siphon. The inferior half of the carotid siphon is actually formed in the cavernous sinus. The superior half is formed by the supraclinal IC. Sometimes another structure which can be present in relation to the clinoidal segment or the end of the cavernous segment would be a keratico-clinoid bony ring. So this is sometimes when the ACP and the middle clinoid process. When they fuse together, they can form a ring around the cover in around the carotid, which can be very important surgically. <coughs> but this is only present in 1.5% of individuals. There are multiple branches which can arise from the um, cavernous portion. And a very frequently absent branch is the recurrent artery of the foramen lacerum which goes back and supplies the carotid canal so this is frequently absent nothing to worry about an important branch which is always going to be present is the meningo hypophyseal trunk so the name tells us what it's going to supply it supplies the meninges and for that you have the medial tentorial artery the lateral tentorial artery and the dorsal meningeal artery and it supplies the hypophysis through the inferior hypophyseal artery so the medial tentorial artery is also known as the artery of Bernusconi Casanari and it's always going to be present. There's also a lateral tentorial artery similarly. There's a dorsal meningeal artery which supplies the dorsum cella, the clivus and the sixth nerve. And the inferior hypophyseal artery is supplying the pituitary gland. Sometimes you can even get a medial clival artery which supplies the posterior clinoid and the dorsum cellae, but it can sometimes just be a branch of the inferior hypophyseal artery. Another vessel which is more or less always present is the inferior lateral trunk. So the inferior lateral trunk gives rise to three divisions, the superior, anterior and posterior. The superior division supplies the roof of the cavernous sinus and the medial third of the tentorium. The anterior division goes anteriorly supplies the dura around the superior orbital fissure and the posterior division actually supplies the fifth nerve ganglion and the dura around the gasiform. You can also get small, small vessels known as the capsular artery arising from the cavernous ICA, supplying the dura of the cella. But these can also be frequently absent. So as we can see here, this is the cavernous ICA with its posterior vertical part, its posterior genu, its horizontal part, its anterior genu, and its anterior ascending or vertical part. So the meningo hypophyseal trunk usually arises at the level of the posterior genu. And the inferior lateral trunk usually arises at the level of the horizontal segment. So here also in an angiogram, you can see the different segments and their branches. So as we saw the C2 or Peter segment, the important branches are the carotico-tympanic artery supplying the tympanic cavity. And then sometimes you can have a vidian artery also supplying the vidian canal. The C3 is the lacellar segment, the C4 is the cavernous segment. And the important vessels, as we can see from the posterior genome, you have this meningo hypervisal trunk. And from the horizontal segment, you have the inferior lateral trunk. Right, so that is all about the embryogenesis of the cranial vasculature, the ECA, and the ICA discussion so far. The rest of the IC will be covered in the next lecture. So to finish off this topic, we can discuss a few practice questions. <coughs>
and uh, let's get into that. So the first question is, this child presented with a history of pulsatile tinnitus since one year and hearing loss since three months. So what is the diagnosis with this image? So the options are, it could be a persistent otic artery, a persistent tympanic artery, a persistent stapedial artery, or a persistent fallopian artery. Okay, so the answer for this question is, it is a persistent stapedial artery. The most important identification is that it is passing through the crust of the stapes. The second question is, looking at this angiogram, what is the diagnosis? So the options for this question are, it could be a persistent trigeminal artery, a persistent otic artery, a persistent hypoglossal artery, or a persistent proatlantal intersegmental artery. So as we can clearly see here, the vessel is arising from the cavernous ICA and it is joining with the basilar at the mid-basilar level. So vessel arising from the cavernous ICA and joining the basilar would be the persistent trigeminal artery. The third question is, what is the diagnosis in this case? The options are, it could be a persistent trigeminal artery, a persistent otic artery, a persistent hypoglossal artery, and a persistent proatlantal intersegmental artery. So as we can see here, the connection between the ICA and the vertebral artery is completely outside the level of the skull. It is basically below the skull. So this is the persistent proatlantal intersegmental artery, which is connecting the distal cervical ICA with the vertebral artery over here, below the level of the skull. Right, so that is all. Thank you so much for attending.